Hey, so now the last uh, last bit of uh, food chemistry here, we're looking at the similarities, the differences between the structures of our pigments. So we talked about pigments before, now we just want to identify what the structures are and uh, what are the, uh, you know, what are the main things we should be identifying when we're looking at the structures and uh, how, do we, how do we differentiate between them here. Um, so the first thing I'm going to look at is the anthocyanins. Um, notice they're always going to have the same basic structure that we see in the middle here. So we see a six-membered ring, and then one, two, three carbons, and then another six-membered ring on the other side. So it's now C6, um, another three carbons linking them, and then another uh, six carbons. So there's two rings on either side with this linkage between. And it is a ring to linkage because there's an oxygen group there. What's different about their signs is what's on our, our terminal places of these rings. Notice they can have alcohol groups, hydroxyl groups, or um, methyloxy groups. So this is our methyl group bonded to an oxygen. Those are methyloxy groups. So the difference between the different types of signs, again, this basic structure is always going to be the same. It is, again, what's in those different places. So next, let's go to our uh, carotenoids here. I'll move it over. Look at this. Here they are. So here's our carotenoids. Mainly what we're looking at is it's a chain of 40 carbons. So they're all C40, 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 C40. So, so it's a C40. It's a chain. What we see is typically we're going to see this um, every other uh, carbon strand is going to be double bonded. So double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. So again, there's some differences to those chains occasionally, but for the most part, they're alternating double and single bonds along this chain. Often, but not always, these end in uh, rings on the terminal side. So notice this one ends in a ring. Or here's an open ring structure. Um, alpha carotene, notice, does end in a ring and a ring over here. And uh, as well as uh, beta carotene has the same. So we have alpha carotene um, that ends in those ring structures, and beta carotene does as well. So we see those. And notice what this also has, because these are pigments, is this is showing us the wavelengths of light that they, um, they will be absorbing. So notice alternating double bonds, C40, rings on either side. If they're not, that's for alpha and beta carotene. Again, those are the ones we want to focus on. But notice there's um, gamma carotene and lycopene and uh, phytoene. And again, there's still the similar structure, very similar structure, C40. Um, and the, the difference here is they just, the rings aren't really closed there. But again, the same basic structure. So notice now we have hemi and we have chlorophyll. So uh, again, our hemi is over here. These are chlorophyll uh, A and B structures here. Notice they both do have a similarity. They have this center ring type structure um, that has alternating double bonds again. So single bond, double bond, single, uh, double bond, single bond there again. Notice same thing in hemi, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, going around the structure here. Now what your book says these are called is their plano heterosilic unit called a porphin. So this is called a porphin where we have that coordination with the um, metal ions that it traps in there. Notice the one difference, um, well a couple differences, but between chlorophyll A and B, this is chlorophyll A. And notice the difference in chlorophyll B is the group right here. So chlorophyll B has this, um, I, I guess we have this aldehyde group that's attached there, where here it's just a methyl group in chlorophyll A. Besides that, our structures are, are pretty much identical. And again, what they do is they're just coordinating with that um, magnesium, in this case, metal ion, uh, inside of that, that planar heterocyclic unit called a porphin. So in case we need to know that. Um, over here we have our hemi. Again, very similar. We have that cyclical structure. The cyclical structure is coordinating with a metal ion. Um, notice same thing here. And again, the difference between these two structures is a memo, uh, myoglobin or a hemoglobin. And the difference between our myoglobin and our hemoglobin is one uh, myoglobin is what's in muscle tissue. Okay. and hemoglobin is the pigment that's in the blood. However, if we look at these two things, they're, they're a very, very similar structure, um, and they do a similar thing, coordinating with the iron. And again, just like when we were talking about pigments, when that iron ion oxidizes from an F2 to an F3, that's where we see the change in 
um, the blood coloring from going from a red to a brown, or again, we could see it with muscle tissue as well if we were talking about myoglobin. So now we want to know why all of these are, are colored compounds, or they can form colored compounds, whereas most organic compounds are either colorless um, or, or, or white powders, white solids, or, or colorless liquids. Well, the reason we have color in a lot of these pigments that we're looking at is the absorption due to the frequencies of visible light by all of these extensive delocalized pi bonds. So notice, in, in all of these structures, we had a lot of alternating single and double bonds. When we have all that alternating single and double bonds, what we can have is we can have a lot of delocalized pi uh, electrons or, or electrons that are in that pi sphere. When that happens, we can get what's called bonding and antibonding regions where the electrons can shift between them. And, and just like in colors of anything else, the wavelength, those shifts between the bonding and antibonding nodes of those p orbitals um, absorb certain wavelengths of light. And so then when they absorb for certain wavelengths of light, um, what we see is what's reflected or what is not absorbed. But again, the main reason for this is due to the number of uh, pi electrons, not, not just pi bonds, not just double bonds, but due really to that alternating uh, availability of pi bonds, where we have single bonds, double bonds, single bonds, double bonds. Now, sorry, this isn't the best image for this, but... Here's what we're talking about when we're talking about the, the splitting um, between those alternating pi and single bonds. So notice, um, if we have only single bonds, the, there's a huge gap between um, the bonding and antibonding regions for those electrons. And so uh, if there are transitions, those are going to be uh, such a high energy transition that they're going to be out of the visible spectrum and we're not going to be able to see them. If we have some alternating double bonds, again, the gap gets smaller, those energy levels get closer between the bonding and the anti-bonding regions, but um, a skin still, they're most likely going to be in that ultraviolet region. Now when we have a lot of what's called conjugated, so alternating or conjugated double bonds, then that gap in energy transitions gets really close together and they enter into the visible spectrum. So they are absorbing light in the visible spectrum um, because the gap is small enough under the visible light to absorb visible light frequencies to jump up to those higher levels. Just want to do one quick slide to show what they're talking about when they talk about bonding or, uh, or anti-bonding nodes. Um, so one reason we have bonding or anti-bonding nodes is because we have p orbitals overlapping, and it depends on if they kind of overlap in phase or out of phase, depending upon um, where the electrons are because they're um, in motion. So again, if they line up right, um, we get an area of lower energy, which is our bonding node, and we get our anti-bonding node if they're not. Uh, lined up in the same. So again, it has to do when we form bonds. We get some hybridization on the bond, and then we have the pi bond at the same time. So, you know, these bonds have come together to form an sp2 hybridization when they bond with a sigma bond here, and now we're looking at this pi bond and how these things are lining up and overlapping with each other. If they're lining up in phase or out of phase, um, it gives us either a bonding molecular orbital or an anti-bonding molecular orbital. And again, what happens is the more of these we have close together, you know, the more pi bonds we have alternating or conjugated, as the book says, the lower this energy transition gets because we have electrons that can jump between them, and so this energy level gets smaller and smaller and more likely to absorb uh, wavelengths that are in the visible spectrum that we can actually see. So the last thing we want to do here is take a look at some structures, some of our pigments, and decide whether they're going to be uh, water-soluble or fat-soluble. And I think this is pretty easy, right? Because if they want to be water-soluble, they have to be polar. They have to have something that's going to line up with our water. And guess what does? Our anthocyanins. So our anthocyanins, because of all the alcohol groups they have, are going to be water-soluble. Um, when we look at our carotenoids, notice a lot of double bonds, a long carbon-carbon structure, no oxygens or hydroxyl groups, no alcohol groups, carboxylic acid groups, and so these are going to be fat-soluble.